about the woman? She's still hanging on. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together tonight to open up your scriptures and to read what you have given us. Lord, I pray that you would open up our minds, that you would open up our hearts to examine our hearts, to see if what you're telling us is what we believe. Lord, please be with us. Please continue to be gracious towards us. Most of all, we just continue to thank you for Jesus and the work that he accomplished on the cross. Be with us tonight as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we are in our second message going through the book of 1 John. Uh, as we saw last week, John was making a declaration that he was an eyewitness of Jesus and therefore he had authority. He had the confidence to proclaim to the church that Jesus is the Son of God. He was up against a lot of false teachers creeping into the church, saying that Jesus was not flesh, that he was a ghost or an apparition or anything other than actual flesh. John gave warning to those who preached a false Christ. And if you lay a hold of this Christ, that is not the Christ that John and the apostles proclaimed, then this Christ cannot save you. This is what Paul talks about in Galatians 1. They were preaching a false gospel that could not save. You must believe in the true Christ, the Christ that's taught in the Bible. And that was the first test, the Christ test. The Christ who came to earth, human flesh, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, was buried in three days, rose again, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. That is the Jesus we believe in. This is the Jesus you must believe in. The next test that John brings is the test of confession. We'll see in order to have fellowship with God, we must be holy. And the way that you can be holy is through faith in Christ, but also through confession of your sin. In our text today, true believers will, will be identified by how they interact with their sin. True believers will be sensitive to sin. They will be quick to confess their sin. And if the Holy Spirit truly indwells in you, sin will always be at the forefront of your mind and you'll be convicted of it. You may be asking, but didn't the Lord already forgive me of my sin? Once I believed, I am declared righteous. If you believe in the Lord, then the answer is yes. You are declared righteous through faith. You've been forgiven judicially of your sin. Your account's been cleared and you have been declared innocent. Praise God for that. You've been forgiven eternally. But now you have a new relationship with God. He's no longer your judge. He's your father. Thus, you must keep short account with your heavenly father. This type of repentance is relational now. It's no longer judicial. You must now confess your sin to your father on an ongoing basis. You must confess your sin as you become aware of it. A lack of confessed sin can result in a loss of joy, a lack of zeal for God, and many other things that the Lord would bring fatherly discipline into your life. One of the marks of a true believer is that if you confess your sin to God, the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse you from all of your sin. So let's go ahead and jump into our text this evening. 1 John, and we'll read verses 1 through 10. So if you have your Bibles, please open to 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. 
That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I don't know about you, but I have two girls. I'm sure many of you have had children, teenagers, little girls, little boys, and you've asked them to clean their room. And they say, mom, dad, I'm done. I'm done cleaning the room. And you're like, okay, let's, let's go ahead and check. So you come into the room and clearly it's not clean. But they say, dad, it's, it's clean. The room is clean. Well, I know you think you did an incredible job, but I don't think we have the same standard here. Did you clean your room in the dark? Well, maybe we should show our children how to properly clean the room so next time their room will be clean, or at least a little bit better. And how do we do that? Well, first let's flip the light on so you can see what you're cleaning. Well, in today's text, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 10, John's going to show what it takes to walk in the light. And he describes this in four points. One, God's holiness. Point number two, God's command to be holy. Point number three, holiness equals confession of sin. And finally, point number four, a warning. It's through these four points that I pray that we would understand so we can have true fellowship with God. And most importantly, walk in the light as he is in the light. Point number one, God's holiness. We see in verse five, John says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. As the apostle John continues into this next phase of his message to the church, he's reminding his hearers that what is being taught comes from God, not from man. Therefore, we must believe in it. As an example, Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, he says this, For I do not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord himself, the one who was from the very beginning, was the one who taught this message. Thus, for this reason, John can speak about this perfectly, and he's able to talk about God's nature and holiness. If this message is rejected in any way, not my message, but John's message, they're not rejecting him, they're rejecting Christ. He goes on to say, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. As he turns the corner in his message, he's moving into proclaiming the nature of God. John proclaims that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This is an important statement as he's starting to set the scene here. John's building a foundation to set the pace for challenges that he's about to give to the church. He says, God is light. What, is, what does this mean? What, what does God is light mean? Is he a, a light bulb? Is he... On the top of a mountain, is he the sun providing light? What does God is light mean? John has his own way of explaining God's holiness through the terminology God is light. 
I'm going to go through a handful of verses in the Gospel of John. No need to turn there, but just listen as I read these. John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, 7. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. John 3, 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. John 3.20 For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. John 8.12 Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So in 1 John, the phrasing of the light is not something that's random. John's using this term precisely. He is light. There's no darkness in him. There's no sin in God. Now I want to take a quick moment here to talk about the attributes of God so this can be a little bit more clear for us. There's a theologian named A.W. Tozer, and he, he says something I think is really profound. Listen closely to what he has to say. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'll say it one more time. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So when John says in this verse that God is light, the scriptures are showing us an attribute of God. God is light. He does not acquire light. He doesn't have some light. He is light. Another way to say this is God simply is what he possesses. God is what he possesses. All that is in God is God. This means that God is all of his attributes all of the time. Something isn't, his holiness isn't switched off so his love can be switched on. He's all of them all of the time. He's not 25% goodness, 30% justice. He's not 40% love and 15% wrath. I know that math doesn't equal 100%, but you get the point. He is all of his attributes all of the time because God is his attributes. As a result of God being what he possesses, it's therefore just, it's safe to accept that John's argument that in God there is no darkness at all, and we can hold to that firmly. <clears throat> if God is what he possesses, and there's darkness in God, then God would be darkness. His nature would be sinful. He would not be God at that point. Praise God, this is not the case. God is light, and in him, there's no darkness at all. Darkness is the antithesis of light. And because God is light, and is therefore holy and perfect, there's no sinfulness, and there's no darkness to be found in him. This can only be said of God since he's holy and therefore not an ounce of sinfulness or darkness can be found in him. Now, what does holy or holiness mean? Let's define this really quick. Holiness is to be entirely morally pure all of the time in every way possible. God is holy in every attribute and in every action. He is holy in his justice. He is holy in his love. He is holy in his mercy. He's holy in his power. He's holy in his sovereignty, holy in his wisdom and patience. He's holy in his anger. He's holy in his grace. He's holy in his faithfulness and compassion. He's even holy in his holiness. All that God does is perfect. Do you believe that? 
It's important for us to believe that. His will for your life is perfect. His answers to your prayers, even if they're not what you wanted, are perfect. His providence in your life is perfect. God's unfolding of events as we see them throughout the world is perfect. Do you believe that? God is perfect. God is light and there's no darkness at all in him. God is holy. And we see this echoed in Isaiah 6 verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Point number two, God's command to be holy. In verse six, we see John say, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. John points out that these people are confessors, not possessors. They confess to be in unity and in fellowship with God. They say they have eternal life, yet they walk in darkness. What does it mean that they walk in darkness? To walk means a manner of life or a consistent conduct. Another way to say this is lifestyle. What is their lifestyle? What is your lifestyle? Their claim to having fellowship with God is meaningless if their lifestyle is in darkness. Walking in darkness in this text specifically is talking about living in unconfessed sin. Are you living in unconfessed sin? Do you have a worldly sorrow rather than godly sorrow? What's worldly sorrow and godly sorrow? Worldly sorrow is is afraid of being caught of your sin. I don't want to be caught because it's embarrassing or, or shameful. There's no resemblance of God in their sorrow at all. Whereas godly sorrow is the idea that I want to confess my sin because I've sinned against a holy God. The God who sent Christ to die for me. I don't want to sin because of that, not because I'm afraid of getting caught. Worldly sorrow is having a conscience that's not pricked or bothered over the things which God hates. Do you, do I, do any of us participate in anything that God hates and it doesn't bother us? I think that's something we should look at. John continues that if you walk in darkness, you're a liar. The scriptures call you a liar if you're walking in darkness and proclaim that you believe in Jesus. This is a clear example of a lifestyle of hypocrisy. You're saying one thing, but your lifestyle is showing completely another thing. You confess, but you don't possess. John says that you do not practice the truth. What does practice mean? It's a similar word about walking, same as walking. It's a lifestyle. It literally means to produce something. And if you walk in this way, then the fruit that it produces is darkness. It's anti-God. Now, don't hear what John is not saying. He's not saying that individual sins that you commit means that you're walking in darkness. It's not what he's saying. John is saying that a lifestyle of unrepentant sin is the fruit of an unconverted heart. But he goes on in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John is saying that you should have a lifestyle, you should walk in the same way that Christ walked. Jesus should be the example for us. We should look to him and how he lived his life and implement and have our life try to mimic exactly how he walked, even though we can't do it perfectly. It's the goal. Jesus conducted himself in a holy manner. And if you walk in this, in this manner, then you have fellowship 
like we talked about last week. You have fellowship. You have fellowship with the church, other believers, the the church universal. You have fellowship, most importantly, with God. Legalism and casual repentance of sin kills this fellowship. So if you walk in the light, we see here that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. A lifestyle of walking in the light is evidence that you've already been cleansed. And as we saw again last week, and Pastor Chris has brought this up as well, we're going to hear this verse many, many times. It's Hebrews 9.22. And the author, or Paul, or the author, uh, says that the shedding of Christ's blood cleanses us from all of our sin. It's through the shedding of the blood of Jesus that we have forgiveness of sin. And through this, believers possess new life and are new creations through this cleansing blood of Jesus. We're saved by grace. And Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, chapter, or Ephesians 2 verse 10, that you're made for good works, which Christ has set apart for you. This genuine faith will always be seen in one's life by their love for God's righteousness. Again, it's a lifestyle. What does our lifestyle look like? Does our lifestyle look like followers of Jesus? Or does it look like the world? We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about progression. Matthew 7 Verses 17 and 20 say, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. What does your lifestyle look like? The more you walk in the light, the more you're going to see your sin. The more sin that you see, the more, a, the more you're able to confess to God. Remember our kids, they're, they're cleaning their room in the dark. We got to turn the light switch on for them. Well, It's the same thing in our spiritual life. The closer we get to God, the more we're able to see our sin because we're closer to the light. So you take the dimmer switch as an example, right? You turn it up a little bit and you can sort of see the dirt in the room, but it's still still dark. Well, the, the more you turn it up, the more of the dirt will be revealed. And the more you need to clean it up. In fact, maybe we'll hire some cleaners to clean it up because of how messy it is. The light starts low. You're not able to see the dirt. You're not able to see your sin. Your relationship with Christ isn't where it should be. But the more you turn the dimmer switch on, the more light that you put into the room, the closer you get to Christ, the more you're going to see your sin. Now, some people, and I've, I've heard this said that I'm unsure if I'm a Christian. Why? What makes, you, what makes you say that or think that? I just have all of this sin in my life. I just, everywhere I look, I see my sin. Have you ever thought of that yourself, about yourself? Have you ever noticed like, man, I, I, am, I am a sinner and it is very clear. I have, but the question that needs to be asked when you ask yourself that is, does the sin hurt my soul? Does the sin prick my conscience? If it does, then the fact that you're seeing all of this sin and having a godly sorrow over the sin is a clear indicator that you are in fact a Christian and it's the Holy Spirit that's searching your heart and revealing the sin to you because you're in the light. 
But the one who's numb to sin, the one who doesn't care or even recognize their sin, is not in the light. The one who goes throughout the week without ever thinking about their sin, with the slightest thought of, of confessing their sin, they're the ones that are failing the test and they're showing that they're not in the light and they're not following after Christ. Matthew 6, 22 and 23 say this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you, if the light is in you, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? That moves us to point number three. Holiness equals confession of sin. And we'll see this in verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, John continues, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This group of people that John may be referring to takes it a step further than the people that he just mentioned. This group is claiming to be sinless. They're saying, I have no sin. This group claims that they are sinless and they're making the claim that they're essentially God because God is sinless. If you make the claim of God by saying that there's no darkness in you, this is a scary place to be. Their confession is a confession of a sinless nature. They contradict the word of God. For example, the Apostle Paul in Romans 3 Verses 14 and 15 say this. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. The claim of sinlessness is destructive. And the claim of sinlessness is self-deception. Therefore, the one who makes the claim to be without sin, they don't have the truth in them. They don't know the truth. And these people don't have the truth in them. They're unconverted. And the possibility of self-destruction should be sobering for all of us. But if the truth is received, there's freedom from this deception. And there's a rest that we're able to find in Christ. John goes on in verse 9, and this verse is so sweet and is such a beautiful promise. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John begins with if. He's he's making a contrast point to verse 8. If we confess our sins... There's forgiveness. Confess our sins. This confession is twofold. If you confess, you will be declared righteous once and for all. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, once and for all, you are declared righteous. This confession is also ongoing. So what does it mean to confess Sin. It literally means to concede that something is factual or true, to focus on the admission of wrongdoing, and to confess our sin is not merely to just admit that we're sinners, but to confess and lay our sin down before God and seek forgiveness. This is a complete 180 degree turn. You're not throwing stuff out on the freeway as you're going straight. These banana peels, they'll, they'll be fine. I'm just going to throw it out. This is getting off of the highway, turning around and going in a complete different direction. Again, it's a lifestyle of confessing your sin. 
we must confess our sin on an ongoing basis. An example of this comes out of the Second London Confession, chapter 15, paragraph 4. <clears throat> it says this, As repentance is to be continued through the whole course of our lives, upon the account of the body of death and the motions thereof, so it is every man's duty to repent of his particular known sins particularly. It's every man's duty to repent of his particular known sins particularly. We confess our sin because of the love and trust we have in God. We need this judicial pardon only one time where we have been declared righteous. But we need parental forgiveness in an ongoing manner whenever we sin. This is restoring a right relationship with God in the same way that repentance and forgiveness restores the relationship between us and our children or us and our parents. An example of this is our, cl- our kids not cleaning our room or something, something happens and there's sin against the dad or the mom from our children. That relationship has been broken. There has been sin that has caused a, a rift between the two. It doesn't mean that the parent no longer loves their child. <clears throat> but what it means is that there needs to be restoration between the person who committed the sin and the person who had the sin committed to them. So what we do is we say, Lydia, Leland, you need to make things right. Right? (laughs) Don't use your kids as examples. But you got to make things right in the relationship. Or else the relationship is broken and it's not going to go well. So go ask for forgiveness and restore the relationship. And this happens over and over again as we continue to offend whoever it may be. You sin against your brother. Go ask for forgiveness. Well, in the same way, we need to ask our Heavenly Father for forgiveness. And have restoration become a continued practice in our life. Through this repentance, God promises that our sin will be forgiven. It's a completed action, this forgiveness. We are forgiven. God no longer holds your sin against you as a judge. Your debt has been paid. But this forgiveness can't just be forgotten. It's not just, I forgive you. And we're just going to move on. God is holy and there must be a payment for sin. We typically call this double imputation. It's a big word. I know. Um, I'm not a good illustrator like Chris is, but we're we're going to try something here. Okay. So double imputation. Spelling might be off, but we'll go ahead. Uh, it's also known as the great exchange, okay? And that is, you have a sinner, us, we're, we're in sin, and you have Jesus, who's perfect and holy, and there has to be some sort of exchange. So when we sin, we deserve the punishment, 100%. We have to pay the fine. But Jesus provided a way out. So God can't just forgive and everything is okay. There needs to be an exchange because God is holy and God is perfect. So what happens is Jesus gives us his righteousness. And through the cross, our punishment is paid for on the cross. So we are no longer sinful in Jesus' eyes, we have righteousness, right? We are able 
to be righteous before God because of this great exchange. That's the whole point of the gospel. The justice of God was satisfied because of what Christ did. He stood in our place and took our penalty through his death. Right? Another way of looking at this is like a courtroom analogy, right? You're here. I'm not going to draw anymore, but you're here and you, uh, <clears throat> you took the cupcake and that was breaking the law. And you're going to stand before the judge and it's on videotape that you took the cupcake. You broke the law. It's clear. It's on the screen. There's no way of getting out of it. You're going to get the penalty. But then somebody walks through the doors and says, hold on, judge. I love that person. I'm going to take their position. Jesus comes in and takes our spot and says, you can go free. I'll take the penalty. The penalty is still judged, but we're able to go free because somebody took our place. And it's through the righteousness of Christ that forgiveness is made possible for the Christian. It's through this that we've been adopted into the kingdom and we've been given new life. We've been given new hearts. And it's for this reason we have a desire to walk in the light. We don't have a desire to walk in the darkness anymore. We have a desire to seek forgiveness for our sins because of what Christ has done. Somebody takes your penalty. You want to do whatever you can to live your life for them and, and say, if you did that, I want to do whatever I can to give you glory, to give you praise. It would be foolish to, to go back out and start eating more cupcakes. Why? It's been paid. True Christians have the Holy Spirit within them. Their consciences are pricked when they sin. They're sensitive to sin. Sure, we, the more you sin, the more you do not repent of that sin, your heart will become calloused and, and hardened and, and we pray that if that happens to us that you would soften our heart that God would, would take the callousness away and make us sensitive to sin and if you find yourself confessing Christ and your heart is a little bit hardened pray that God would soften your heart pray that the sensitivity towards sin would never go away pray that you would hate your sin so much that you would not delay your confession, that you would run to your father with open arms because you know he loves you. He showed he loves you. It's the allergies. <laughs> Finally, though, verse 10, we see a warning. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. <clears throat> John concludes here in verse 10 with a warning. To say that you have not sinned is a sin in and of itself. You're calling God a liar and the word is not in you. God has said that all people are sinners and they're guilty. And if you say that you're not, you're a liar. You're not a Christian. <clears throat> Some scriptures here that back that point up is Psalm 14, verse 3. Psalm 51, 5. Isaiah 53, 6. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6. Romans 3, 10 through 19. Verse 23. And chapter 6, verse 23. So to deny this fact is slanderous and blasphemous. Only Christ may be said to have no sin. <clears throat> I pray that this is not true of any of us here today. And if it is, repent. Be quick to repent. Put your faith in Christ and believe the gospel. Because we saw in verse 9 that if you do, He's faithful and he's just to forgive you. Is the dimmer switch of your life low? 
or is it turned all the way off? My prayer for all of you, including myself, is that we would all grow closer to God and begin to turn that dimmer switch all the way on. I pray that we would all see our sin, that we'd be quick to repent and walk or lifestyle in the light. I'm going to close us in reading and praying through Psalm 51. And I pray that this would be an ongoing prayer for us, that this would be at the top of our minds. Let's go ahead and pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amen.